Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the class. This is David A. Cox with PCClassesOnline.com, and today we're going to be talking about iPhoto Basics. Now, iPhoto comes with every Mac. The current version is iPhoto 2011, um, and uh, you can do a whole bunch of different things with iPhoto, and it's a really fantastic program. You know, I mean, even though I'm trained in Photoshop and Pixelmator, I still use photo iPhoto almost every day. Um, just because it does so easily what I need it to as far as organizing your photos, uploading them to things like Facebook or send them out to friends through email. It's a really fantastic piece of software. So let's go into it. Now we're going to be going over a bunch of the basics today. We are not going to be talking about the projects that you can do in iPhoto. That is a different class, uh, which if you need to access is already in the video library. You can check those out whenever you want, of course. So when you have photos, uh, whether you shoot them with your iPhone or you shoot them with your regular digital camera, basically iPhoto is your digital shoebox to keep them all organized. And you can organize them by date. You can actually, uh, there's, there's facial recognition technology, so you can uh, organize them by who's in them. Um, and if you happen to shoot your photos with your iPhone or iPad, technically, um, there's a feature called geotagging so that iPhoto will actually know where you were standing when you shot the photo. So we're going to start by going over the different ways that you can organize your photos. Then we're going to go into a little bit about editing, um, sharing photos to things like your email as well as Facebook. And then at that point, we'll open it up to questions from all of you. So if you have questions, you can, of course, type them for those of you who are here live right now. Um, and uh, we'll get to the questions either if we hit that topic or later on at the very end. So you can type those in whenever you want. So let's begin here. So over here at the very top left of my screen, you'll see that we have four different library views. We have events, photos, faces, and places. Okay. Now, um, this is of course on our dummy account, which we use here for, um, uh, demonstration purposes. So um, events, these are all photos, by the way, they're not mine. Um, they're from the magazine that I do a little bit of work with. Uh, events right here is sort of like when you go out to uh, to shoot photos, um, let's say you go on a vacation, okay? It's going to take every single day that you're on vacation and it's going to group them together into an event. Now, when you're done with that trip and you go to import them into your computer, you're going to see them all here set up as different dates and times. Uh, you don't see that here. You see them with different names because someone has actually already gone through and named all these things. Um, but if you want to combine them, like let's say, for example, let's say these five here, this whole row here, let's say these are all part of one event. One of the things you can do to really easily combine them is just drag and drop one into the next. Now the first time you do, you're going to get this little pop-up here that says, do you want to merge these events? Well, I recommend clicking do not ask again and just click merge. So now all of those photos are together now in this one group. Now you'll notice that as I move my cursor over some of them, especially the ones that have multiple photos, you see little preview images of all the different photos inside that event. This is a feature called skimming. And so what it does, it just shows you that little preview. If you want to actually go into it, just double click one, two, and you'll see all the different photos that are inside that particular event. If you need to actually edit one of the photos themselves, that's where you double click on the photo again, but we'll get into that in a little bit. So some people like events, other people don't really care for them. Me personally, I don't, I don't really use events. I'm a person who's uh, very accustomed to using uh, albums, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That's kind of an alternative fifth method that you can use to organize your photos. Now, the next library is the photo library here. Now, photos is just simply everything. All the photos on the computer are located right here. And how you group your events together will determine how many of them are all together. Okay, but they're all here. And whichever way you use it is totally up to you. The third method is to use something called faces. Now this is doesn't work great on a uh, on a dummy computer, but I can probably get this one to be pretty accurate. Okay, so what happens is your computer scans uh, the faces of all the different people in your photos and it tries to figure out who is who. So for example, I just you saw me just name one here 
by the name of Tom. Now I chose Tom because I know he's going to be in a bunch of these photos. And you'll notice that at the bottom of my screen down here, it says Tom may be in seven additional photos. So what happens is when you go through here, you can click once to accept or twice to reject. So you're telling the computer, no, that is not this person. Okay. When you're done, you'll end up seeing a giant bulletin board here of all your friends' faces. And so you can just, if you're trying to find a specific photo with some with one of those people in it, you can just go into their little event right here, this their little category, and you can see all the photos that they are tagged in. Okay? Not a lot of people use faces. Um, I don't personally use it. I don't actually know any of my clients that do. The next option is places. Now, because of the fact that this is a, a dummy account, I can't show you places because of the way that it works. The way that it works is that when you shoot a photo with an iPhone, uh, it's using the GPS in the phone to tag the location. So with places, the way it works is it will show a pin drop on a map, and you can actually zoom down to even the street level and see where you were standing when you shot that photo. Um, now, I did recently take a trip over to Europe, and uh, this feature was very, very cool. Unfortunately, um, I had to manually put in all the locations because of the fact that I didn't want to pay a lot for data um, since international plans are very expensive. Now, if you want to be able to use this feature but don't have an iPhone, there is a way that you can do it. The way you do it is when you go into a photo, okay, what you can do is double-click on it, Okay, and you see down here at the very bottom where it says info, if you click on info, you'll see right here at the bottom right it says places lookup. Um, now I have it currently disabled, but I can just simply enable that. And you can type in the location of wherever you were standing when you shot that. Let me see if I can go in right now and uh, just make that happen. I don't think we really need to because of the fact that... Yeah, we don't really need to go over that part. But anyways, you just type in here the location, whether it's the zip code, the city, or even the exact address, and you'd be able to tag it that way. Now, the other method that I mentioned that I use is a feature called Albums. And it's a manual process, but the reason why I use it is because I don't personally feel the need to have all of my photos with me wherever I go. I'm very comfortable with just having a album which I actually call my best work, and I have it on my iPad and my iPhone. So the way you do this is you actually go up here into the menu, up into the file menu, and just click where it says new album. Now one of the things that's important to do is that you're not clicked on a photo when you do this, because otherwise the computer's gonna think that you wanna take that photo and put it into that album. So we're just gonna go file, new album, okay? And you can see it appeared here on the left-hand side. It's currently called Untitled Album. And you can just type over it. Call it whatever you want. So you can say, uh, Picks from Rome. Okay? And once you're done with that, you can go into whichever method up here that you prefer. I prefer Photo Library. And you take the photos that you want, and you can individually drag them and drop them into the newly formed album. Okay? You can put as many as you want in there. Now, one of the things that's important to know about this, okay, is that if you delete a photo from an album, it does not delete it from the library. If you delete it from the library, it will delete it from the album. So just watch out for that, okay? But you can add as many photos as you want. I'm looking here at some of the questions that are coming in, and I think a lot of these we're going to go over at the end. Hold on one second. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Um, Andrea has a question. Of, well, Andrea, that's a little bit off topic. She's asking about uh, a service that, that they do have commercials all over television uh, called Shutterfly. Um, and are they good for making albums? Um, Andrew, what I would recommend you do is check out the video that I did a little while ago on iPhoto that has all, the whole the whole tutorial. It includes the projects. 
Um, in my opinion, I've seen the books that Shutterfly puts out. I put, I've seen the books that Apple puts out. The quality is significantly different. Um, so I would recommend you do the Apple one if you really want it to be a high quality product. Okay, Stephanie has a great question here, um, which I've had a lot of clients encounter, which is they go to import their photos, and uh, Stephanie, is your, is your camera a little bit older? Maybe uh, four or five years, maybe even older? She said yes. So um, some older cameras uh, don't have a gyroscope in them, and what that means is that basically cameras now, for the most part, know which way your photo should be. So if you are shooting in landscape mode, they know to flip the photo so that it's in landscape mode. And if you're shooting in portrait mode, up and down, it knows to, to do that as well. So if you have a problem with that, if you have an older camera and you get your photo in here and it looks like that, okay, there's a very easy way to fix it. All you have to do is click on your photo so that it's selected. And on your keyboard, you're going to hold the command key and tap the letter R as many times as you need to until it is correctly oriented. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Okay, great. So that's a little bit about organizing your photos. Now there are also other methods that you can check out, like you can see photos that were imported in the last 12 months, the last photos that you imported, flagged. Flagged is something we can go over right now. Now different people flag photos for different reasons. I typically flag photos if they're really high quality, the best of the best, or if I'm going to do some sort of a project with them, if I am going to create a photo book or a calendar with those particular photos. Basically what you're doing is you're just kind of marking it so that you can do something with it presumably later on. Let's say I want to use this photo right here. The way you flag a photo, I'm just going to give you the shortcut. It's a lot easier than having to go through and manually add it in, um, is you just click on the photo. And on your keyboard, you can hit Command, period. Okay? You'll also notice, for those of you who can see it, at the top left, there is now a little icon that looks like a flag. And if I go over here to Flagged, there is that photo. Now, one of the things that's important to note, if I delete a photo from Flagged, it's still here. Okay? You're just simply telling it to also have a reference point over here. So again, usually you're going to use it if it's a special photo or you're going to be doing something with it later on. That's how you flag a photo. The other method that you can use is you can just click up here at the top right. For whatever reason, I don't always find that it registers, so that's why I just kind of always recommend using the command period method. But you can do it whichever you want. One important thing to note as you start to gather more and more photos is that you know photos do take up a good amount of space as we all know and so one of the things you can do is uh, when you you're gonna go through eventually one day your photos and you're gonna probably clear a whole bunch of them out okay everyone does that um, I probably shoot I don't know eight photos for every one that I keep okay for every one good photo there's eight others that I get rid of and when you delete them from iPhoto they do not go to the trash that's on your dock here at the bottom of the screen. What they actually do is they go into this trash over here on the left hand side. Now, I don't actually have any deleted right now, but let's just do a few right here. Okay, we'll just delete those. So now you can see when I go into trash, here are all of those photos. So one of the things that's important to do is just to periodically go into the trash and make sure these are all photos you really do want to get rid of and then when you're done just click empty trash up here at the very top right hand corner of the screen and that's and that will permanently erase them Angela had a question I saw a little while ago where she deleted photos and Angela I take it you did empty the trash oh, and I'll continue from there she did. Okay. So Angela had a question where she uh, accidentally deleted photos, hit empty, and she was wondering if there's a way to get them back. Well, it's complicated. If you back up your data on your Mac through Time Machine, yes, you can. All you actually have to do is go into the main photo library and then enter the Time Machine 
so that your computer can start accessing backed up past photos. Another trick that you can use if you like, it's a different application and I picked it up because I thought it would be a great recovery tool uh, for clients in case they need it. There is an app that you can actually now get right through the App Store and it's called Lost Photos. You can see it down here at the bottom of my screen. And the way Lost Photos works is if you have photos that you have been emailed or you emailed out and then deleted and forgot to save them, all you do with Lost Photos is you sign in with your email address and it will access the email servers and try to get them back. And uh, I've gotten back some photos from years and years ago that I thought that I'd lost. And it's a pretty cool feature to, uh, to be able to have. It's only about $5. It's a really, really cool application. It might even be less than that now. It's called Lost Photos. And like I said, you get that just by going to the Apple Store, the App Store rather, Apple icon, App Store, and then just search for it, Lost Photos. Okay. Next, I want to talk about Photo Stream. Now, Photo Stream is a feature that is built into the, uh, it's built into iPhoto, but to use it, you need to be running a computer that has either Lion or Mountain Lion. Okay. And the way it works is if you shoot a photo with your iPhone or your iPad, or if you should, you have multiple computers, if you import it on one of those, it will automatically fetch it on your computer without you having to actually plug anything in. So for example, I was yesterday shooting a bunch of uh, photos here on the property that I needed because um, we have a rental that's going to be available soon. And it was great. You know, I don't have to plug in my phone to my computer. I just shoot the photo, open iPhoto, and it's right there waiting for me. Obviously, to do that, you do have to log in, okay, which is just using your Apple ID password. But uh, it's a nice feature to have if you want. I see, let's see here. I think I see a couple questions here about, I, about photo stream. Let me go through them real quick. Okay. Stephanie had a question about how does, I, how does PhotoStream save the images. Basically, Stephanie, to answer your question, the way it works um, is that when you, sh if you, uh, let's say you've been using PhotoStream for a couple months, okay? PhotoStream itself just kind of lets you access the last, I believe it's 30 days of photos. But what then it will do is it will then take it and it will create an event around it. So it will say December photo stream, January photo stream. So then you have all the photos right there in a album, in a, in a event rather, of all the photos that you shot in that particular month. Cool, okay, great, that seemed to answer her question. Next we're gonna talk a little bit about editing photos themselves. So let's go in here and let's uh, take a look at some of these images here and try to, uh, we'll just use this one here as an example. So when you want to edit your photos, all you have to do is click, double click on the photo so that it becomes full screen. And then down here at the bottom right, you're going to click edit. Now, uh, right here at the very top, you'll see there's a, the other shortcut for rotate. A minute ago, I showed you command R, which is just a faster way to rotate the photo, but this will do it also. Enhance is a one click option where you're basically telling iPhoto, to do whatever it thinks is necessary to enhance the look of the photo. Usually it'll make uh, the colors kind of stand out a little bit, it'll make them a little brighter, um, and it will, let's see what it looks like with this particular image. That's exactly what it did, it just made it a little bit brighter, brought out the greens a little bit more. Um, I don't know if I like it because his shirt here is now, looks like it's on fire, it's a little too bright, so I'm going to undo it. Now, just as a reminder, yes, you can click undo down here at the bottom right, but the better way, the, the method I try to teach everyone, is command Z, okay? That will also undo. Red eye, ooh, let me, I gotta get an example. Give me one second here, let me fetch an image. Okie dokie. Let's do this baby here. Oh, it's pretty low. Oh. That'll work. Oops. There we go. Okay. So we have a baby here with the classic red eye, right? Let's show you how to remove it. We go right back to where we were under edit here. 
Now, when you click on Fix Red Eye, as you can see, just by that one click, it did remove it on its own. Now, that's because this box right here is checked that says Auto Fix Red Eye. If it doesn't do a good job, the other thing you can do is you can use this little slide bar here and you just move the dot so that it's the size of the pupil. Okay, so that right there is a little too big. We'll take it down a little bit in size. And then what you do is you just put it right over the pupil and just click. Now, I made it a little too small now. The problem I've had with this is that, usually, first of all, auto fix does usually work pretty well. And as you can see here, it did actually perfectly. The one thing it can do is it can make the pupils look a little too big, as in it makes the person look a little bit high, but just be aware of that. Let's go back to one of the other photos here. Okay. Let's take one of these images. I'm trying to find one preferably without people. Okay. So let's say when you took the photo, it looked like that, okay? It's not perfectly straight, so one of the things you can do is right here through the editor is you can straighten the image just by clicking right here. Now when you do that, it'll put a grid over the screen so you can kind of have a reference point. Um, a lot of times I'll try to use the horizon or a wall or something like that as a guide. And then you just take this little slide bar here and you can move it back and forth and what's nice is that it will crop the image so that it doesn't look all funky. Okay, so there, right there, it, it was about 2.6 degrees off or so. That looks to be about right. Click done and it will save the image that way. Next is obviously crop. I'm sure all of you are familiar, but if I want to just get it on this gentleman right here, when you click crop, it's going to show you that you have these corners here, and when I put my cursor over one of the corners, it turns into a little crosshair. So then what I can do is I can drag, click and drag, and I can focus the image so that it's just wherever I want it to be. Typically, uh, in photography, they have something called the rule of thirds. So you really want to try to lay out the photo so that you have it in three different sections here. So the head should be right around there. Okay? Click done when you're done, and as you can see, it cropped the image right there. One of the tricks I've started doing in pretty much all of my photos is I shoot all of my photos very wide. And the reason why is that it's such high quality that I can then later on crop in and get it perfectly framed. Um, you don't even need to be a good photographer anymore. You can be a good editor and have just as good a product. And finally, we have the retouch tool, which is usually everyone's favorite. Um, let's see, I will use this woman here as an example. Okay, that is not a good photo. I'm sorry, I know who shot that. That is not a good image. All right, so you can see here on the left side of her face, she appears to have what looks to be a mole or something like that. Well, using the retouch tool, we can remove it. Now, the retouch tool it works great for anything from moles to acne to scars to wrinkles. You name it. We jokingly call it the wrinkle remover. So when you are using the retouch tool, you have that same slide bar, and you want to typically keep it pretty small because you can retouch it a few times if you want. So I'm going to get it really far down there. Now the other thing you may want to do is you may want to zoom into the picture. And the way you do that is if you look here at the bottom left, we have yet another slide bar, and I can click and zoom in to the photo. Now if I need to navigate up a little bit, I have a little navigation window that's just appeared and I can just kind of move it over here. All right, now the tool is still too big, so let's take it down even, even further. And what you're gonna do is you're just gonna kind of paint over the area that you want to remove. And as you can see here, just with one application, it pretty much removed it. This is not the highest resolution photo ever. Let's see if I can show you a different example instead. Okay. I'm trying to find a good example. Okay. Um, let's use this gentleman right here on the left hand side. Okay. So you see here he has this line right across his forehead. Okay. As well as a couple of uh, little lines here underneath his eyes. I can go right here into edit, click on retouch. 
increase the size just a little bit and just trace that line there you go it's gone a uh, little mole right here oops I missed it there we go now it's gone and you can just kind of touch up all your photos just a little bit make everyone look amazing you know remove those bags crow's feet whatever you want now if you want to see the before and after here's how you do that look at that look at that difference I'm gonna zoom back so, you, so that you can really appreciate the um, how the final image looks one of the ways you can see the before and after effect is hold down the shift key and that will show you the before so check that out that's before that's after before after not bad right it works very well you can check it out do it as you need it now when you're done touching up your photos obviously one of the things you're going to probably want to do is share them with your friends now there's different ways that you can do this you can send it as an iMessage you can send it through email now one of the big differences between how a PC works and how a Mac works is on a PC you would more traditionally go to an email and you'd attach the photo whereas with the Mac you go to the photo and you share it to email so what you're going to do is click and select whatever photos that it is you want to work with here I just kind of selected a whole bunch here and then what you're going to do is click on the share button at the very bottom right corner of the screen now here are uh, just basically the examples you can see here of what you can do with it you can order prints if you decide to do that option it's going to be printed by Apple professionally and they're going to mail it to you um, it uses your Apple ID so the same credit card that is linked up to when you buy music it's the same one that you're gonna see it's gonna go on that bill as well you can tweet them out okay it'll just shorten the URL and make it so that people can see them there there are very few people who use Flickr anymore it's kind of now an older social network um, but for those of you who do you can share it to Flickr Facebook is one of the very common uh, ways that people will share photos now when you share it to Facebook you can either create a brand new album or you can put them into a pre-existing album you can share them to your wall you just have to sign into Facebook to be able to do that and then of course there's email so let's go into email right now and I'm going to show you a couple different options that you have now when you first do it it's of course going to give you the, the very traditional method where it's just kind of all laid out here now whether or not the person sees it this way is going to depend on how what kind of email they use and what program they use to access their email so some people you know will use um, they'll go to their email through the web others will use programs like Apple Mail or Outlook Express on the PC or Windows Mail um, so it depends on how they use their email as far as how they see it um, now there's other options here other than just kind of your classic layout so if you look over here on the right hand side we have different templates now these can be especially fun if you're having a party or you're opening a gallery something like that so for example there's announcement right here so you can see it kind of it tweaks it a little bit and you can type in your information here so I can say party invite okay now the way it sends it through this method they will see it just like the way you see it right here whereas with classic they will not necessarily and there's placeholders for text so if you want to type in your your uh, text to people you can say dear friends I hope you join us for a an outdoor grill okay barbecue whatever and then when you you're done you just simply type in the uh, email address of your friends it actually talks to your address book so you can just type in their names and then click send and that's it and there's a whole bunch of different templates you can see here everything from journal snapshots corkboard cardstock and as you can see here it's actually taking the text that I already wrote and it's adjusting it to work with all these different templates I already showed you announcement here's a celebration okay great for a birthday party collage letterpress and postcard so you can do whichever ones you want here now let's say you decide to use this particular template here postcard but the problem is that you want this photo here and this photo here 
not a problem. All you have to do is drag one photo and drop it into the other and they'll swap. You can also reposition the photos by just clicking and dragging and you can see here a little hand will kind of grab the photo so you can center it just the way you want it. Stephanie asked a question if this would work with any email address. Yes it does. Um, all you have to do to get iPhoto to work with your email, I'm going to delete this one, is you're just going to simply go up to where it says iPhoto at the very top of the screen, go to Preferences, Accounts, and make sure that your email address information is here. If it's not listed here, just hit the plus symbol and click Email. By the way, this is also where you go to add your Facebook account. Let's see here. I see a few questions coming in. I'm going to go through them real quick. Okay, Bill says he has an iPhone and an iPad, and PhotoStream works on both of them, but it does not work on his computer. Uh, Bill, is your computer running a current operating system, either Lion or Mountain Lion? Okay, probably my guess is what's wrong is that when you go up here to iPhoto, you're going to go actually the same place we just were. You're going to go back into Preferences and go into PhotoStream, and you see how this is unchecked? You need to make sure this is checked. It's not just the settings and system preferences. This box has to be checked as well for it to work. And Bill just confirmed that was the, what was up. Good. Glad to help. Let's see what other things we can answer for you. Okay, question came in, if I shoot the photo with my iPhone, does it reduce the quality when it transfers to the Mac? No, it does not. It's still the full, high-quality, high-resolution image. Let's go through some of the others here. Ah, great question. Okay. Um, oh shoot, who was that? That was, oh, that was Bill again. Okay, Bill was asking a question about, you see how here, as I scroll through the library, I have right now four photos across the screen. Bill was complaining, he said that he, he's not complaining. He has an issue where he only sees two photos and he wants to be able to see more. Uh, it's right down here at the very bottom left. There's a little slide bar here for zoom, and if I punch in, there you go. That's probably what you have right there. I'm going to guess yours is slid all the way over to the right. If you just slide it over a little bit to the left, you'll see more thumbnails. They'll just be smaller. Okay? Typically, I like to keep mine right around four or five. Ah, printing photos. Yes, we can talk about printing photos. Absolutely. Let's get an example here. Let's shoot. Let's do use this photo here as the example. So um, I, I actually see now two questions that both have to do with printing photos. First of all, you don't need a photo printer, not a devoted photo printer anymore, because frankly, all printers for the most part have very, very good quality, the very good ability to print on uh, paper. More than anything, it's the paper. You want to make sure you get good photo paper. You can get it from Staples or Office Max, wherever you want. If you ever need a recommendation, you can always shoot me a quick email and I'll be happy to uh, do some quick research for you and find a good uh, paper stock that you can buy online. Um, so really, that's the most important thing. Invest. If you're going to get photo paper, get the good stuff. Don't get the cheap stuff. So when you want to print a photo, all you do is you select the image. Now, technically, you can print more than one photo at a time. If so, just select more than one. You're going to go to File and you're going to go to Print. Now, from here, you can either just print the photo, you can choose the size, okay, so if you want it to be a 4 by 6 you can do that, or if you want to get a little bit creative, okay, let's go back to where were we, standard, or you can add in some other effects here, like a simple border, a simple matte border, or my favorite, a double matte. Now, right now, you see that it already it looks a lot better here. This is something you could print, just throw it in a frame and put it up, it would look great. But you can also change the colors here. 
And to do that, just click over here on the right-hand side where it says Customize. So now, if you look here at the bottom right of my screen, we have a whole bunch of different options that just came up. For example, themes. Okay, that'll actually take us back to essentially where we were. We don't really need to do that. Backgrounds here is the big one. So if you don't want kind of a cream color like it is now, you can change it up to something more dark green. Typically, you would want this color to match some sort of a color in the actual photo. So maybe more of a forest green, or there's actually a leaf print right there. Okay, that's a little too cheesy for me, but that could work if you want. And then uh, over here on borders, you can see here we have all sorts of different types of double mat borders. So it doesn't have to be just your color and then white. You can have that white center border be something else. So uh, for example, I could do a dark green, even though that looks terrible. Oops, maybe more like that. Okay. Layout will only uh, really be an option if you had selected more than one image. So if uh, let's go back to photos here as an example. Let's select this whole row and now go to file print. Oop. Sorry, I hit order prints, my bad. Let me cancel that out. File print. So now you can see here the four photos that I had. I can now select all together. Same thing that I had before with the email. If I want to kind of adjust the photo, I can just grab it and tweak it. Now some of these uh, layout options you'll also see have give you an ability to do text. So if you want a little description, I can say, you know, everyone sing along. Okay? And that will print right on the image. So that's how you do more than one photo in a double mat. Now, if you want, you can even from here, before you go to print it, you can also edit uh, a bunch of the image, which we're actually going to go over in a little bit. Um, I'm going to actually get back there just a second here. Finally, under settings, if uh, down here where I typed in everyone sing along, you don't have to use the font that they use. Maybe you want something a little more creative. You can change it by going here into settings at the bottom right. So then from here, you could go instead of Optima, you could go into Rockwell, and instead of size 14 font, you could go to 20. Okay. In this case, it's actually a little too big, so it had to adjust it, and it looks absolutely terrible. I'm going to hit cancel because we need to still go over some of the other basic photo editing tools. Okay. So when you're back here in edit, sorry, I didn't mean to skip this part. I saw that at least one person picked up on that. There are two other tabs here at the very top. One is called effects and one is called adjust. Um, and I recently shot a whole bunch of photos and just by using the adjust tool was able to really, really boost the color and just make it look phenomenal. Um, let's let me show you a better example, better than this. Okay, let's go back to Google Images and let's get an image of a sunset. Okay, I'm gonna try to find a sunset that is not photoshopped. Usually, I'm pretty good at telling. Okay, this one here, view original image, does not look photoshopped at all. Okay, so I'm gonna use this as my example. Now, some of you have probably seen on Facebook at some point in time, you have friends who took photos of a sunset, and you're like, I don't remember it being that color. Well, it probably wasn't. They probably just tweaked it that way. So let me show you how to actually make that happen. And this is going to be a perfect example. So we go back to where we were, edit. And uh, before we, let's, we'll go over effects first, and then I'm going to show you adjust. That's going to be the real magic one. So here in effects, you can lighten it, darken it, tweak the contrast, make it warmer or cooler. If you go cooler, it's going to add more blues to the image. See here how it looks. Doesn't that look a little bit more like it was shot in winter? And then I just hit warmer, and it looks more like it's shot in summer. See, doesn't that, just that alone, already we've tweaked the image. Just look at this. Original image, and after the effects. Okay. Some other effects you have down here are black and white which I don't know why you would do that with a sunset, since that kind of defeats the purpose. Undo. 
You can add sepia tone to it, make it look antique as I call it. You can blur the edges. If you blur the edges, it gives it kind of this, it has an interesting effect. It gives it a more romantic look. Now, with some of these, and edge blur is a perfect example, you'll notice that there's a little teeny tiny number one over here on the right hand side of my screen. And if you click the arrow to the right of it, it will up the intensity. So the more, you can go up to 11 is the maximum. So now it's like this dreamlike state, okay? That's a little too much. Probably good is right around two or three. Right there, that looks pretty good. It's subtle enough, but it's not overpowering. Vignette will make all the edges uh, appear black. Matte will make all the edges appear white. Fade will do just that. It'll fade the color. Boost. And again, with boost, you can change the intensity. Okay. And then, of course, if you want to go back to the original, you can hit none. Now, here's where you get into the real magic, is going to adjust. So in adjust, this is where you get into sort of, these are pro-ish tools okay so you can really change the different exposure levels change the highlights the definition so here's how I do it on mine typically what I'll do is I'll up the exposure just a little bit and the contrast depending on the image obviously if you add more contrast it's gonna make the colors significantly more intense and if you throw it over to the left it's gonna make everything very gray so I add just a little bit of contrast saturation same kind of deal. If you do too much saturation, it's going to be obvious. Like that does not look real. But you can add a little bit, and it'll just add a little subtle effect. Then we have here definition, highlights, shadows, sharpness, and denoise. When I'm working with color, especially landscapes, typically what I'll do is I'll especially work on the shadows. Okay, not so much with this one, because it's actually pretty well lit. The highlights, so it's kind of tweaking the color a little bit here. Sharpness you can choose to do or not. I typically do not like the photo to be overly sharp. I'm actually going to take the highlights down here a little bit. And then we get into uh, color temperature. So this is where we can really tweak the image to make it look more intense, change the color of the sunset. So if you want it to look almost purple, like look at that. It's like the skies are purple, the sea is purple. Okay, now to a trained eye, someone will be able to tell that that's photoshopped, or in this case, just I photoed. I don't know, is that an adjective now? Um, but you can play with it however you want. I mean, that's obviously fake right there. If you go too, too extreme with these things, it can look very fake. So just to show you, if you hold, once again, if you hold the shift key, that's the original image, and that's the after image. Okay, let's take the intensity down just a little bit. Okay, so before image, after image. One you want to hang, one you don't. And that's basically photo editing 101. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to uh, stop the video for those of you who are watching it online. For those of you who are here live, I'll uh, continue answering any questions if there are any more. I've answered quite a few of them already. And uh, for those of you who are watching it on the web, hope you've enjoyed it. Check out some of our other videos. Stop the recording now.